Welcome back, dear viewers. Um, we just have a ziara of Hazrat Ali Akbar with Brother Ibrahim Ansari, and hope you enjoyed that. Um, now joining me, um, welcome warmly, Brother Bilal. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you doing this morning? Alhamdulillah, I'm well. Good. I'm well. You're a bright and uh, chirpy. Bright so. and breezy, bright and breezy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, this morning we're going to speak about another topic um, relating to um, sort of mental health, and you know, so we're going to have a discussion on addictions. Mm -hmm. um, now, addictions are, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind, we'd think about gambling, we'd think about alcohol, um, smoking, and, you know, people like me wouldn't delve into those sort of things, and I'm sure, Shalom, most of our viewers are the same. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps we can talk about some of the things that are not so obvious in our minds about, you know, the addictions that people go through, or maybe even we have ourselves. So mm -hmm. um, hopefully you'll talk us through exactly what, what is an addiction. Addiction is... Actually, you said hopefully our viewers, most of our Jews, we pray, inshallah, that our viewers are not addicted to anything, but we wouldn't judge them if they were, and we no. advise them to get help. Because it can be really difficult mm. for Muslims to come to terms with something like addictions, where one, the first um, component of overcoming this problem is to admit I have an addiction. And if sometimes people can't even admit it to themselves, yeah. or admit it to a third party to go out and get help, then they suffer in silence. So that's one of the real problems and something that we really want to avoid. So we're not, we're not necessarily, we would, we're not here to judge, but we're just here to analyze and kind of explore a bit. So an addiction is something where it's a behavior that a person feels that they need to repeat. It's talking about something that a person feels almost a psychological compulsion mm -hmm. to repeat. And it's something that disrupts their life, that they're, in, they're in, unable to, um, it may affect their performance or affect their quality of life. Yeah, um, in terms of if they don't fulfill this kind of behavior. So it's, 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 so it's a compulsion, but not like an OCD compulsion, yeah. but more like a, a compulsion in respect to a specific thing, okay. substance, behavior, thing. Do they get a high from it? Is that how it initially sets in, the, the triggers of an addiction? Because nothing, you will not get addicted, on, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, um, overnight. So I wouldn't start smoking today and be addicted to it tomorrow. Although some people say that crack cocaine is that strong that um, the first time that people smoke crack cocaine, psychologically, the kind of high it gives them, right. that psychologically, psh, they can be bound up with that demon. Okay. They can be bound up with that. They're always searching for that hit. So the high mm -hmm. they receive the first time takes them to a certain kind of dimension that after that, for those people that unfortunately ruin their life, yeah. what they're trying to do, they're still chasing that first, right. trying to get back to that first one that they never can get back to. Mm. Oh, goodness. So, um, and what kind of substances are common that people are addicted so, so to? You, yeah, so you have chemical and non-chemical. So chemical, most famous is alcohol in our society in Great Britain, acceptable, taxed, legislated for, but acceptable in society, which is quite bizarre because people die from, yeah. from alcohol-related diseases by the hundreds in, mm. in, you know, year, on a yearly basis, um, cut with a car accident or you know, sclerosis of the liver or other kind of medical complications. So um, we think about um, alcohol, alcoholism, um, as a first, but there's this cocaine, there's, there's crack, there's other hallucinogenic drugs. Um, the list goes on in terms mm. of heroin and scag, and you know, there's so many um, different forms of, of um, chemical addictions, but there's also non chemical addictions which people don't really mm. often talk about. Which are, for example, gang gambling. Um, gambling is in the DSM, this, this, this uh, manual that they use to, um, that used to formally diagnose people with, with, with various either mental health illnesses or, mm -hmm. for example, like even addictions. Um, so gambling is in there. But also um, non-chemical addiction, I believe there is something, and there's lots of literature to suggest, there's something called porn addiction where people watch pornography and it, like, like gambling, it has a, impact on neurology on brain activity right. on brain chemical and brain release and so people actually get addicted um, to to non they can get addicted to non-chemical um, substance or practices so like with gambling for example they've done experiments um, research taken place connected uh, utensils and machinery um, to study to monitor brain activity with people who gamble and the part of the brain that lights up um, 
are what you call dopamines, which is the same parts of the brain that light up if somebody's taken a certain amount of cocaine, for example, oh, right. or, or other, other substances. When, it, when the race is taking place, there's a certain high, a certain yeah. excitement, a certain rush. So it's the actual process that they go through with the gambling. It's not that someone may, you know, I always naively perhaps think that perhaps somebody's going through financial difficulty and they just want to make that money that quick buck. Might be the in. It might be the in. It could be that. But then yeah. there is the one that you're saying where it's, it's actually, they're getting a high from perhaps watching the race, um, yeah. horse racing. And that's, yeah. that, so it's actually things like that. That, may, that might be what you call secondary gain. Mm. So the reason why they're trying to gamble is to win back money they've lost or just to make some money. However, they may be experiencing a high that they haven't even accounted for. So they don't really know that they're addicted. They just might know they've got a problem. People start lying. People start yeah. stealing. People mm. start to, you know, it may affect the person where, for example, they've lost their job because of certain types of behavior. They might have done something inappropriate at work. has led to them lo losing their job. But because this is the kind of problem where people suffer out of shame and uh, of consequence, you, you might have a guy, a bit of a stereotypical scenario, but where he's lost his job because he's got a gambling problem. He's been hiding it from his wife. Instead mm. of him saying to his wife, you know, I lost my job, because yeah. he's worried about the consequences, he'll dress up, leave the house at you know, 7.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning, and come back in five, in five or six in the evening, acting as if he's still working. Wow. Yeah, how, do you, how do people like yourself help people that have got these addictions? Then? It's extremely difficult. It's one of the challenging areas, um, addictions, um, whether it be gambling, um, substances, whether it's even pornography. It's quite a difficult thing to, um, because it's not just, how can I say, you might look at an iceberg mm. and you think the bit of the iceberg you see is the, is, is the actual iceberg, analogy being the problem of gambling. But what usually you find underneath is there's some kind of emotional deficit or psychological issue which is hidden and you really need to address that thing that's under the surface that's hidden that the person is um, using the gambling to mask or to cope with. So with chemicals, pe oftentimes people are self-medicating. So people have been through tra traumatic experiences, difficult experiences in their life. And just like they m you may go to your doctor or your psychiatrist and you'll prescribe something, some people ch um, through life experiences or whatever the case may be, coping mechanism have used alcohol or cannabis mm. or different things to cope. So what they're doing is trying to self-medicate, deal with the pain or deal with the stress. Through. So it's very, very difficult unless you can identify the base problem and also give people different coping strategies to ad address that initial problem. It's quite difficult, isn't it? Because as human beings, we're complex, there's so many layers to us. So if somebody went through a traumatic experience and then they to perhaps cover that pain, they then turn to something that's going to give them that initial high. And before they know it, it's not that pain that they're dealing with, it's their addiction or how they yeah. dealt with it becomes the, the issue. So, exactly. so in your role, you're breaking down those different layers that they've built up to yeah. understand what yeah. was the, the trigger, I guess, in, in there. And it can, be, it can be very challenging work mm. because it's, it's, you're dealing with the compulsion, you're dealing with that thing about appetite and about riding the wave. And we've all had we've all had that, even mm. if it isn't because we've been addicted to anything. But even if it's we said, you know what, I'm not going to eat chocolate or I'm not going to, you know, eat a particular yeah. food, and then you have that craving, and you're not going to die if you don't eat the chocolate. No. But there's that there's that window of when it's like, oh God, should I go to the? And it's about willpower and being able to resist. There is that element as well, you know, Absolutely. like in terms I, of I have the psychological, yeah. in terms of that psychological component. So it's very challenging. I mean, tell it's me honestly, when I crave chocolate it's like no that's it there's no even a layer to think you know stop and don't have it because you just think well it's not going to cause me mm -hmm. harm so um you you just you know go ahead with it um but in terms of sort of like um how do therapists talk to people with addictions and try to reverse and you know get them out of the habit of doing what they're doing whether it's um you know the alcohol gambling drugs. So, some token therapists they take may take the long approach um where they just try to understand the person as a whole individual. This addiction is one aspect of many issues that they're trying to address. And even underneath that issue of addiction, there's more um, developmental things that may have impacted them in their formative years, neglecting the family or whatever it is on an emotional level and try to work with the person to understand help them to modeling, accepting that person and not judging them, modeling how they can be accepting of themselves. Like with, in other words, accepting ourselves with warts and all. We're not perfect, mm. but we can actually come to terms with, look at ourselves in the mirror, who we really are and accept that. 
and help the person to, to, to kind of gain skills or a desire to move beyond using this substance and really contemplating, you know, by really coming to terms with how it's not helping them and how they can receive, I can, what can they do to manage life without this particular behavior. So there's, that's one way. Well, yeah. some people are more, some therapists, cognitive behavior therapists tend to be, you know, oftentimes more technique and more specific problem orientated. So they may like go after the addiction, psh, go straight for it. And that might mean, you know, using certain techniques to elicit emotion. So um, you might speak to somebody with an addiction and you ask them to talk about, you know, you, or you start to explore how it's played out, when did it start, so on and so forth. And they may speak in a kind of, almost like a self-editing way, or maybe leaving bits out of the story that is quite important, but they might not think it's important. So no. what some therapists do, for example, is bring paraphernalia into the room to really solicit or evoke the kind of emotions to help the person dig that bit deeper about right. what's going on in the process. So they might mean bringing in flour, but in a, in a bag that looks like what cocaine is sold in. For example, if the person's addicted to, to porn, like bringing a, a remote control in or some kind of paraphernalia mm -hmm. that represents the remote control to turn, to not turn, to download, to down, you know, whatever it is. And then you know, go through certain processes in terms of the exploration to really find out what's going on, to really assess and analyse like, what's going on for the I person. I was reading, um, you know, as somebody had written to a sheikh, um, and it was posted on social media about um, a young boy, late teens, sort of saying, um, I find it very difficult to not glance at women mm -hmm. um, of the opposite gender. So, um, and I was thinking that's quite interesting because he has to somehow find a way, doesn't he, to un do what he's thinking because mm. it's causing him haram. But you don't know where that could obviously lead to later. Um, but he's recognised in himself that this is not right and I don't want to be doing this. So, and I thought it's quite commendable that at you know, the age that he is, it's quite a natural thing to, you know, for some people to look for the, other, um, or the opposite gender. So really, is it easier the younger people are or is it sort of as we get older, we just become more complicated and we just you know, bury our issues deeper and deeper and then we just have ways to cope or is it sort of something that it doesn't matter about age, it's, you know... Well, people are, people struggle with addictions at, at many different ages. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's very hard if people have been ingrained in that thought process and behaviour thought process. Um, it's almost as if it's part of their behaviour. It doesn't mean because they've been, say, for example, taking something like heroin for 20 years, they can't stop. Right course they could stop mm. might take an extreme amount of effort on their part and um, having really good safety mechanisms in place and it may mean even falling off the horse a few times failing quote unquote failing before they they mm. really succeed and they're clean for longer periods of time if not mm. you know leave that substance alone it's doable but yeah for sure it's harder for people the longer they've been ingrained in a certain a certain behaviour. Is there a certain personality that gets more addicted to certain substances or is it something that it's irregardless? Well, there, there, there is some information to say that um, there is a, um, an, a, a, an addictive gene, but um, I mean, there's so many environmental factors and environmental mm. cues that need to be, I believe, net there and, and that will tell you more than a kind of genetic disposition mm. to an addiction. There needs to be a, a social context, a personal narrative, you know, that ties into mm. people's lives as opposed to just kind of saying, well, there's an addictive gene, there's a gene for this, there's a gene mm. for that. Because human beings are complex. Yeah. And um, we're kind of nature, nurture, and how yeah. the two interact and interface. Yeah. You know, mm. it's that deep. Any last words before we finish for this morning? Um, we all struggle with willpower. The power of Ramadan, the power of fasting, the Sunnah fast, that's one of the master keys. Even, mm. even as a psychotherapist, I'm just saying as a Muslim, mm. the power of fasting. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? You're, yeah. you're actually, yeah. It's very good advice. Um, and I think, yeah, um, how true, how true. Um, thank you so much. We are nearing the holy month of Ramadan. So pleasure. Um, pleasure. good opportunity to perhaps um, help ourselves if we've got certain Allah, habits. Inshallah, okay. um, inshallah, you have a blessed day and we'll, we'll see you another morning. Thank you. Um, now we're going to the kitchen and we'll be joining Sister Sana and Sister Fahima.